Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Mind Muscle Connection Podcast. Today is a Q&A episode and I have three questions I want to dive into. But first, before I go into those, I just have a few ways you can help support the podcast. So first, if you're sick of just focusing on weight loss and instead want a body recomp, then my one-on-one online coaching program is for you. I help you lose body fat and build muscle with my body recomp training, nutrition, and lifestyle methods. We look at things like your lifestyle and biofeedback to individualize your training and nutrition program to you and your specific needs. I also find that there's at least one to two bottlenecks outside of the training and nutrition protocol that are keeping you from seeing the results you want to see. And so we are really able to dive into that in the coaching. If you're interested in learning more, you can find the link in the show notes, or you can reach out to me on Instagram, which I'll talk about here in a minute. If you aren't interested in full coaching, I do one-on-one consultations where we troubleshoot any issues you have and or map out a game plan for the next couple months. Lastly, if you aren't interested in either of those and you want to learn more about Body Recomp, I have my 75-minute masterclass on Body Recomp, what it is, how to do it. You can find a link to that in the show notes as well. Next, you can follow me on Instagram, Jeff, H-O-E-H-N underscore, and that's where I'm most active on social media. So if you have any questions or want to reach out to me, you can find me there. And then lastly, if you found this podcast to be helpful in any way, if you could leave a rating and review, and then that will help more people find this podcast. But again, I appreciate everybody that listens to this podcast. So Let's dive into today's question. So the first question I have is, in a fat loss phase, if my cows are too high one day, should I decrease the next? This would be this concept called calorie cycling, right? So I want you to, so we know that for, in order to drop body weight, we need to be in a calorie deficit, right? And yeah, ideally you want to, you want that calorie deficit to be Daily, sometimes there's going to be some things that pop up. And so your average caloric intake for the week is the most important. So this can be a strategy that you do utilize. So again, a lot of times people will overthink what happens in one day, but really, again, we have to take it. We have to look out on a longer time scale, right? It's not because one day you're at maintenance or in a surplus, that means you're going to gain all this weight or whatever it may be, or you're just all of a sudden going to be plateaued out in your fat loss goal for your fat loss goals. Again, we have to zoom out and look at the bigger picture and like what you do on a longer time scale is going to be more important. So that's why I like to break down this, th- this concept of calorie cycling and how, again, what you do on most of the time is going to be more important than like one single thing. This can be, uh, again, so this is a concept of calorie cycling. And so this can be really helpful for clients who tend to get down on themselves for having four days. And it can also help you develop what I would call like a damage control mindset around nutrition. But I will say that there's going to be, uh, there's going to be times when it's more helpful than others. Plus, there's going to be some pros and cons to this approach. So I want to go over in a little bit more detail what calorie cycling is and what we can, how we can implement it into fat loss and muscle gain goals too. So what is it? So your weekly average caloric intake is going to have a larger role on fat loss or muscle gain than what you do in one single day. Because of this, it can allow for some flexibility from day to day. Instead of hitting the same amount of calories per day, you can have some days that are a little bit higher and then some days that are lower so long as your average calorie intake for the week is where you want it to be and where you need it to be. And again, you find that out by where your body weight is trending over time. However, there are going to be some pros and cons to this approach. And depending on what your current goal is, whether it is fat loss, which in this question, it was fat loss, muscle gain or maintenance, it may affect if it is a viable strategy for you. So let's first kind of talk about how to do it. So if you want to hit 2000 calories per day, but if you want one weight, one day to be 2,500 calories, then you can do something like this where it's six times per week, you do 1,900. And then one time per week, it's 2,500 calories, right? And that's going to equal 2,000 average caloric intake for the week. So you can do five high, two low, four high, three low, whatever, whatever you want to do there, right? Just realize that the higher they get in one day, the lower they will have to be on the others to make up for that, right? So if you want to have a day that's 5,000, then it's now you're going to be super low on those other days. And that's probably not going to be conducive to your goals. So we'll have to look at that here. So that's what it is, right? So on the, so basically to continue on the how to on the low days, I take away from carbs or fats, but usually carbs is where we're going to take away that, that food or add in carbs. Protein's going to stay the same throughout the week. I like to uh, uh, avoid large variability from high days to low days. For example, we want to be careful with having days one day that's like 3,500. And then because of that, now you have to go like 1200 the rest of the week or whatever. So we, or just however else you divide it up for the week. We just really want to avoid this massive variation from one day to the next, because I do think that then if that's what you're doing here, where it's, oh, I'm going to have one really high day, I can just eat anything I want, everything I want, and then you have the next day be super low to make up for it. I feel like that ends up being borderline, just like yo-yo dieting and probably not great from a body composition standpoint, but also like mentally as well too. Let's give you some pros of this approach. 
So First Pros, it's going to give you more flexibility. If you have an event come up or like to have a little more food on certain days of the week, you can increase your calories on those days so long as your overall caloric intake for the week is in the range you want. So again, that flexibility is going to be key for a lot of clients there. Again, you have certain events that come up and you know that it's going to be really hard to stay on track. All right, well, let's just make some adjustments to your to your nut- nutrition. Let's give you, maybe you have a little bit more food on one day. Now we're just going to have to go a little bit lower on other days. But again, that helps you get, that helps people get away from that kind of all or nothing mindset with it, where it's, oh, this is going to be hard to manage and moderate. So you know what, screw it. I'm just going to be off. And then that can lead to many other days that you're not on the plan as well. So that's a big thing. There's the flexibility that it can give you. Next, it can help with training. So you can also eat more food on days when you have tougher workouts. So if you are in a fat loss phase, you've probably found that like certain workouts are really tough to push through because you're just super low calorie. So this can help you with, with the training side of things. Like on those days where you have a really tough workout, you can get a little bit more food in and that will help you perform better in those training sessions and you won't just feel super depleted. So that's another way you can utilize this. It's not always just going to be like from a food standpoint of, oh, we have events coming up. So this is going to give me more flexibility. I can do what I want. You can also utilize it if you're super into this. Events aren't really an issue, like a problem for you. Uh, then you can use this for like training and make sure that's good. I honestly think that's probably going to be the best application of this. If we're talking like what's going to give us the best body composition, I think that is going to be the most applicable. But we obviously have that flexibility built in for events that do come up if you need to. And then I also think the pro of it is it, it helps you realize what you do over the week is more important than one day. Like I've mentioned a couple times already, it's people get a little too caught up in one day and they're not focused on, again, what you're doing for most of the time. It's the same thing. We can take this on a shorter, shorter, shorter time frame where people, they have one event and they overly think about that one event when it's, okay, you still have the rest of the day to, to stay on track. That's going to be more important than that one single event. That one meal out or whatever is probably not causing you to regress. It's what you're doing around that that is, is the bigger problem, right? So same thing here with your food intake. Now, the, those are the pros. There are going to be some cons to this approach. So if you go too low on certain days because you have some really high days, it could be tough to manage hunger on the low days. Depending on how you respond to this, like you may find that on those low days, you may get super, super hungry and it's going to be really hard to moderate and then therefore defeating the purpose of having of doing this calorie cycling. Now on the flip side, you may have a really high day and then you go into the next day where now that you've had a really high day. And again, this is more in the context of fat loss, but you can really do this probably at maintenance too. But it's like you've been in a deficit, you have a high day. Now you maybe added in a little bit of tasty food in that high day. And now all of a sudden the next day, you're just super freaking hungry and it's really hard to moderate on that low day. And then you also combine it with now you have less calories to work with on that day. So that's a potential con, right? It's not only as on the low days, you get super hungry, but after those high days, you could also have some cravings that linger around. I'm sure you've had those days where whether maybe it's like around the holidays, I always think of like Thanksgiving where, you know, so for those who aren't familiar in the US, we have Thanksgiving. Pretty sure they have it in Canada. I'm not sure if they have it everywhere. So if they do, I, I apologize. But I know here in Canada, for sure, we have Thanksgiving. I know I'm pretty sure it's on a different day in, in Canada. But the, it's an excuse to eat a lot of food. So we eat a lot of food. So then the next day, people are always like super hungry the day after and their cravings are high. And it's probably because of the amount of food they had and the tasty food they had. So really, you could take that with any holiday that you celebrate or any event that you eat a lot of food. It's like the next day you get super hungry. It's the same kind of concept here where if you have more food and more tasty food, you might find that your hunger is and cravings are a little bit higher. So you just have to, it could make thing, it could make it here. It's a little bit tougher on those days. Next kind of con here is going to be on low days. I see a lot of people let protein fall too far. They have their lower days and they don't really make an adjustment with, they just eat the state. They just focus on calories and then protein ends up falling by like 20 to 50 grams. And that's not going to be great for body comp. So you need to make sure that on those low days, you still keep protein at a reasonable amount. Again, you have one day where protein's a little low. It's not a big deal. It's just if that becomes regular once a week, twice a week type thing. All right, now we're going to run into some issues here. But also to go back to the hunger side of things, not only could hunger be a little bit higher from being on a low day, but also the fact that now you're going low protein, that may not help either. So it can be a way to help mitigate that hunger on those days. And then lastly, this can lead to a binge restrict mindset with food. If you're in this, oh, I'm going to go super low calorie and I'm going to have this kind of quote unquote, like massive cheat meal day that can be problematic for some people. So we have to be careful there with that. I think a good rule of thumb is even on your high day, you probably don't want it to just be a day where you just eat anything and everything. Like you still want to eat most of the foods that you've been eating, just maybe in a little bit more, 
that would be best case scenario. Next would just be like, hey, we just maybe you, you still have a good base of your whole foods, but like one meal is maybe a little bit more like tastier food versus you don't want to have the entire day be like, oh, it's a free for all day. I can do whatever I want. I don't think that's going to be great for your body composition. So let's talk about different phases of this, if, whether you're doing maintenance, fat loss, or muscle gain, how you can do calorie cycling. So you can have higher calorie days on tougher workout days. So this is for fat loss. So you can have higher calorie days on tougher workout days, or when you have events come up that will be tough to stick to your normal calorie amount. So again, having that flexibility there, or whether there's an event for that week, or if you need it for around a workout, you can have a higher calorie day. Just pay attention to the hunger on lower days and days following higher days, following higher days on, on those lower days. And then do not let your protein fall on your low days. Like really pay attention to that and make sure that you are in a good spot there. All right, so let's say you want to apply this for muscle gain. You can place more food on days where you have more intense workouts or workouts that use muscle groups you want to prioritize, right? So say you're trying to prioritize your legs. Maybe you put a little bit more food on those days in a building phase. So that way you can really push training on that day. Or if it's your like back, same type of thing. Just look out for going too low on your low days to avoid being in a calorie deficit on the low days. So the biggest thing is you don't want it to be like your calories are so high one day that then now you have to make up for it and go into a deficit another day. We probably want to make sure that it, that the lowest we would go would be closer to our maintenance. So don't go lower than your maintenance level calories when building muscle is a goal. Cause we really want to try to limit that deficit as much as we can. Again, if you have one week, one day out of the month or two days out of the month where you end up falling into a deficit, which you won't really know for sure, unless your calories are just super low, because again, there's a lot of things going on. You're going to be fine. It's just, again, we're trying to limit the amount of times that we're in a deficit as, as much as we can. Then we have calorie cycling during a maintenance phase. So this can be a great strategy during your maintenance phases. Same rules apply here. We want to avoid large variability from your low to high day. So again, we don't want to have this massive day where it's, oh, it's a cheat day. I can do whatever I want. And then now I have to make up for that by going super low another day. Again, we really want to avoid those large variabilities. It's probably not going to be great from a body composition standpoint. Same thing. Don't let protein fall too far on the low days. Like we want to make sure we hit that minimum there. And again, pay attention to hunger on low days and days following the low days. So that's how you would go about calorie cycling. Let me know if you have any questions on that. Hopefully that was helpful. And now we'll go into the next, the next question. So. How important is, before I go into that, again, I just wanted to go over, that can be a good strategy to implement if you need to. Just, again, be careful, understand what it is, make sure you have a good game plan around it, and then just understand the limitations and the pros of it, but also understand the cons of it and the limitations around using it. It's not some magic fat loss benefit thing here that's going to speed up your metabolism. Again, it's just a way to help you. At the end of the day, it's a way to help you adhere to your calorie deficit over longer periods of time versus feeling like you need to be super rigid with it. And oh, every single day I have to follow this. Like, again, we have a little bit of flexibility built in there. So let's dive into the next question. So it's how important is protein timing? So I did a podcast episode a couple of weeks ago on protein timing or meal timing in general. And I talked about how important it is and how it's underrated. And I do think it is very important. I think there. I think there's a few things that we really want to pay attention to here with protein timing. I think the big takeaway that I'm going to get into here with this is we just don't we just want to be careful with completely screwing it up. So let's talk about this, though, in terms of is protein timing important? So I think in terms of protein importance, it's going to come down to number one is going to be your overall protein intake. If you're hitting at least one gram per pound of body weight or more, it's like protein timing becomes a little less important. Now, that's not to say that it's not important. I don't want that to be like, oh, OK, it doesn't really matter what I do. It's but it becomes a little less important if you're hitting the right amount of, if you're getting a good amount of protein in per day. Same thing with, and the number three would be like protein quality, right? So it's like, what is that protein made up of? Is it mostly like plant-based protein? Is it, or is it like protein that's going to have all the essential amino acids in it? Same thing there. The more protein you have throughout the entire day, the lower the protein quality becomes, right? Like you can have a little bit more mix of protein from grains and plants and stuff like that, right? It doesn't necessarily have to have all the essential amino acids. It just, again, it's not to say that you shouldn't focus on that at all. It's just, it becomes a little less important the more protein you get overall. So if, if you're hitting all your protein, you're going to be in a good spot, right? So this is again, 0.8 grams per pound of body weight or more per day. But like I said, I wouldn't hear that and now be like, okay, protein timing does not matter because I do think it still is important. We just, the biggest thing is we, once you get, once you have your protein number hit for the entire day, 
we just don't want to screw it up. So, you know, the lower your protein is, the more important things like protein quality and timing is. If you're getting under 0.8 grams per pound of body weight, you probably want to, you want to time it a little bit more to where you're not going super long periods of time without protein, right? It becomes even more important around your workouts. Same thing with protein quality. The lower amount of protein you have per day, the more important it is to pay attention to protein quality. So again, this is why typically for vegans, the general tip is that, hey, you need to make sure that you just get a little bit more protein than somebody who eats more animal-based proteins. So again, I wouldn't completely neglect timing and go like five plus hours or more regularly during your, uh, your eating window, okay? So let's say you do have enough protein. Again, I'm not saying, oh, let's go six, seven hours without protein. Again, is it going to be detrimental? No, but it's just probably going to be less than optimal. So again, don't completely screw that up. Like, I still think every three, five, three, four, five, six hours, you're going to be solid there, especially if you're hitting enough for the entire day. Or also timing can also be like how much you have in each meal. So again, if you're hitting your overall protein then take that's priority number one. From there, you don't necessarily have to have it be super spread out and even from meal to meal. Like you can be like, hey, one's going to be 25, one can be 50. Again, we just want to avoid the, okay, you have one at 10 grams a meal and then the next meal is like 80, right? We just want to be somewhere in between and we don't want to like completely screw that up. I think the other big thing from a timing standpoint is, and to me, this is, Regard, irregardless of if you're getting enough protein per day, I think the most important like protein timing thing is going to be making sure you get some protein in around your workout if body composition is your goal, right? Making sure that if you don't eat protein beforehand, you get protein in within one to two hours after. If you do get protein in one to three hours beforehand, then maybe you could go one to three hours after. We just don't want to go hours upon hours without getting protein before and after. So I think that is honestly, probably to me, that would fall a little bit higher on the priority list than like your overall protein timing for the day. But either way, that's the one that if I'm going to focus on protein timing, make sure you get some protein in around your workouts. Again, it doesn't have to be the moment that you finish your workout. Just, we just don't want to go a long period of time without it. And so again, remember, this is just all in the context of body composition. If you're just looking for overall health and you're not worried about body composition, you can be a little bit more flexible here with this. But from a Body composition standpoint, losing body fat, building muscle, like we, again, overall protein intake is, num is priority number one. We want to make sure that's there, right? The number two is going to be, hey, the timing of that becomes less important. Number three is going to be the quality of it. It becomes less important the more protein you have per day. Now, the less protein you get per day, the more important these things like timing and quality become. So hopefully that was helpful. And then we have one more question. So these are two and two. Basically, the question was, what's the hype around length and partials? And also, what do you think of sets consisting of only length and partials? What's with the hype around length and partials? They may have, we may have touched on this a few times, and I know I've had guests on that have talked about it. Milo Wolf's talked about it multiple times. Me and Brian Borstein have talked about it. I'm sure I've talked about it with Jeremiah and Brandon. I'm sure I've talked. I'm just sure it's been talked about a lot overall. So what's the hype? So basically, recent research coming out has showed that length, the length and part of the range of motion might be slightly superior for muscle growth, right? So we have full range of motion would be when a bicep curl, you're coming to the bottom and you're coming all the way up to the top. The part at the bottom where your biceps are stretched, that's the length and position, right? When you come up to the top and you can see me on YouTube, so you can see it. But if you're on a podcast, it's again, where you're like really flexing, you're trying to push that, you're really contracting there. That's going to be the shortened position, right? So as you can see on YouTube, it's where I'm bringing my hand closer to my body. That's going to be the shortened position, right? So that length and position has been shown to be a little bit more superior for building muscle, right? So there was research that they looked at full range of motion. And they found that full range of motion was better than partials, but those partials were done in like the shortened position, right? But then they broke it down and it's, okay, what part of the range of motion is the most important? And they found that length and position is it. So this is leading to more people focusing strictly on that part of the range of motion. Um, and so that's where, again, it's just been this research around it. Now, from my understanding of it, there was just a study that came out on the glutes and the glutes did show that they benefited from more work in the length and position. So I think that's the glutes. I think that's, the, I think the triceps, biceps, calves, th those were the ones that I think they've done for sure. And so now there's still this kind of, hey, the research doesn't show that it's beneficial for like certain muscle groups, right? They haven't really shown it. Like, I don't think in the research, they've specifically shown the chest, which again, we're just, people are hypothesizing here that it is good for the chest based on all the other research. Like I said, they just crossed off the glutes. I don't think there's much in the back. I think back training is kind of hard for them to do. So that's the sticking point there, but Logically, when you think about the back, you would actually think that the back would benefit from this the most because the hardest part of the range of motion 
for the back is when it's in the shortened position. So it's, it's the hardest part. So you usually fail because of that. Whereas like when you're in the lengthened position, you're not failing as much. And so what that means is you're probably leaving a little bit in the tank on the length and part with your back. This is where, and we'll talk about length and partials, but this is where we incorporated some length and partials where it's like, you're, we're spending more time in that length and position and we're not doing that full range of motion. Right. And that typically in back movements is going to allow you to do a little bit more weight as well too. When you do that, what does this mean? I don't think you should completely abandon full range of motion, shortened position, but it might be a good idea to allocate some of your volume to length and partials for muscle growth. And somebody asked me about like, how much am I doing? I think when I did when I looked at all the sets I'm doing and the one I'm doing from like length and partial only sets, which we'll talk about here in a minute, I think it was like maybe 15% of the volume is just length and partials. So again, we're not, we don't want to completely neglect shortened position, full range of motion. Like I still think you should bias that most of the time, but you might want to focus a little bit more on this length and position, especially in maybe some muscle groups that you, one like the back, again, they don't have any direct research to show that on the back. But again, like I said, logically thinking about it, like it could be beneficial there. So you may want to utilize that in your back, but any other muscle group that you feel like you maybe are lagging in, really look into some getting a little bit more work in the length and position there. And so to go off that second part of the question, what do you think of sets consisting of only length and partials? So what would a only, what would a length and partial set look like? So your full regular set would be that full range of motion and a length and partial only set would just be, you're just working through that length and position and you're doing like 60, 70% of the range of motion. So in a curl, it would be, Hey, we're doing that bottom 60, 70% and we're not coming all the way up. So that would be what a length and partial set would be. And the question was, what do you think of sets consisting of only length and partial? So I do have a little bit of experience here of this because Brian Borsi, my coach has been programming this in for me. So love them so far. And I think it's a great tool in the toolbox, right? I think it's a different way to train. It's interesting. I mean, I do really like them so far. Been it in my last training cycle and this one where we've implemented these. I was dealing with some elbow tendonitis on tricep exercises, and it seems to have really helped with that. Just for whatever reason, not like fully locking out has seemed to be a little bit better on my uh, elbow. And I have been program programming this in for my clients as well, and they seem to enjoy them as well. There's a little confusion around them, so it does require a little bit more like communication on what's going on. But for the most part, they, they seem to like them when they understand the concept of what we're doing there. And one more. Oh, so with the length and partials too, one way you can incorporate this as well is, so like we talked about, you can, just, it doesn't have to be every single set you do is a length and partial. And you could start to implement it to where it's like maybe a little less than a quarter is. And if you like it, maybe you ramp it up a little bit more. But what we were doing is like, we'd have one to two sets at normal range of motion. And then the last set would be a length and partial set. This phase, I definitely noticed that Brian has put in more just, <clears throat> like the partials on all the sets of one particular exercise. So I think really it's like maybe last phase, it was like 5%. Now this phase, it's 10 to 15% of my volume is from length and partials. So really interesting stuff. Again, it's like I said, this doesn't mean you should go and neglect full range of motion or the shortened position. There's still probably some benefit from it, but I don't think it's a bad idea to incorporate some of this stuff into your training. And there will be more and more research that comes out. So we'll find out more about like back training, hopefully how it works for certain muscle groups, if it works for all muscle groups. But right now I think we're batting hundred percent on that. So we'll see our thousand percent. So we'll see where that's at. So that's it for this episode, guys. If you have any questions on anything, let me know. And I will chat with you next time. Mm -hmm.